guys have recently heard me go through this already, but I am Brandon White. I am the Education Program Manager here at NICE. Um, my role is to facilitate all of our education programs for youth and adults. And this evening, I'm going to be taking you through the adult education teacher training. Um, as many of you can probably guess, uh, our teacher training looks very different now than it did six months ago. Uh, back in April, NICE made the collective decision to do online classes all the way through the end of the calendar year. I think part of that was that we recognized there was an impact from the tornado that was then exacerbating the impact from the pandemic and that we also serve a very sensitive and vulnerable population that are disproportionately affected by this pandemic. And so to protect our clients and to ensure that we are putting um, clients at the center of our programming, we pivoted to online services. Um, one thing that we have experienced during that time is an increase in student engagement. So our uh, attendance is actually up. Um, the degree to which students are sticking around in the classroom and doing their homework is up. Uh, our enrollment is still down overall, but this is a great, great sign. Um, we've also been able to enroll students who were not able to take classes before this because of barriers like transportation, childcare, um, other limiting factors. Obviously, as you can kind of uh, guess, access to the internet, access to a laptop um, are kind of further barriers in this version of classes. But the majority of our students, about 75%, actually participate on their phones. So we're able to have class with them just holding their phone and having conversations with their um, teachers. So I'm going to go through how we're doing that tonight, some differences between online instruction and in-person instruction, and where the department's really headed over the next few months, as well as give you all a detailed understanding of our curriculum and our structure. Uh, one of the reasons is that we hope you stick around uh, into next calendar year and can join us in person at one of our sites here in Nashville. So let's go ahead and get started. First of all, I just want to remind everyone of the population that we talked about uh, during our orientation. So NICE predominantly serves refugees. We are a refugee resettlement site. Um, we also serve asylees and immigrants. We serve a much wider base of clients here in our adult education um, community than we do in any other program. The clients that we serve in this program tend to have been in the country for a little longer. They've been able to secure some form of work, either one or both partners, uh, and Possibly some of the older kids in a family group will have income, um, but a lot of our clients for adult education classes are single moms. Uh, we, have a we have a very large population of Somalian clients that are in this program, as well as Vietnamese, Burmese, um, Sudanese, Ethiopian, the list goes on. Um, we do have a lot of Spanish speaking students as well, but they're not a majority of our classes. Tonight, I'm just going to give you a little preview to the structure of our program. Excuse me. <coughs> well, I apologize. I'm going to give you a little overview to the structure of our program before we get started. When we are in person, um, typically we have classes on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays for our ESL program. Uh, this is one of the three branches of this department. Those classes meet at two morning locations. <coughs> I'm so sorry, I'm getting a little choked up. If you notice in red, there's highlighted information about Community Day. Community Day is an opportunity for um, service providers in the community, government agencies, local entities, to step into our program and talk about community-based resources. <coughs> mm. So um, basically, our program is funded through the State Labor and Workforce Development Department. And one of the reasons that we have community days is because we believe that by creating access between the members of our program, our clients and our students, 
and between the community and government resources that we're actually encouraging civic participation. So we're overcoming cultural barriers while at the same time connecting people to resources to invest them further in the community. Uh, this is an integral part, in my opinion, of integration into US society. Whether it's the library coming and telling uh, students how to check a book out, um, whether it is the Metro Nashville Police Department, civilian side coming in and talking about uh, interactions with the police, um, behaviors, um, what's legal and non-legal, um, or legal and illegal. Um, we also have a strong relationship with the victim advocacy branch of the police department. So we do have conversations about things like domestic violence and inner partner abuse. Um, we think these are very important because uh, in other cultures, they often go unchecked. And we do deal with a lot of cultural groups where inner partner violence is discouraged to be talked about. So uh, anytime that you speak up about something like that, you are sacrificing your connections with your um, community, your local community. So we do have programs um, with Community Day that just target a myriad of really important conversations. Uh, we also use that opportunity to bring in uh, nursing groups to do um, health screenings and just all, all kinds of things. The list goes on. We've had American Red Cross come in and talk about needs mapping. Um, I could literally sit here and tell you all about Community Day for hours on end. Um, but really the point is that we're connecting our students to the community in a really intentional way. And... Um, trying to both give them access to resources that they may need desperately, while at the same time creating that investment in their local community. Um, in addition to that, our program integrates workforce development, civics, and English literacy. So all of our classes have some kind of um, job and life vocabulary, work and life vocabulary. Um, this is really important because we are dealing with adults and we are dealing with adults who often have a hard time envisioning their own personal goals and what the most successful version of their future could look like. And so part of what we try to do is just generate exposure about um, different careers, uh, generate exposure about the pathways to those careers. And we're going to talk a little bit about that here in a minute. In addition to our ESL program, we also, ha also have a citizenship program. Typically, when we are in person, that citizenship program meets on Mondays and Wednesdays, and you can see the times listed there. We offer this to any person who is eligible to become a U.S. citizen. So you have to be eligible to apply. Most of our client base is going to apply using what's called the N-400 application for naturalization which means they're a green card holder for four and a half years and they're applying to become a citizen. During their interview, they're going to be asked um, civics questions. So part of the curriculum for this class covers that civics content. They're also going to be asked questions about their application specifically. And then as a general rule, those USCIS officers have the ability to ask follow-up questions to intuit the degree to which that student understands English. So if they ask a follow-up question and you're not able to fluently answer it, you might fail the um, interview. So one way that we use volunteers for this program is actually practicing the interview, asking follow-up questions, digging into what those answers should look like, and then there is a written portion to this exam. Um, that written portion during the interview happens over the iPad. So we do the same thing in our program. Every student gets to practice filling out um, questions over the iPad and signing their name. Um, we also go over things like assimilation activities, what you can do with your, your citizenship once you have it, um, how to apply for a passport. Um, we, we register every person once they successfully achieve their citizenship to vote, and we remind them about the voting cycle. Um, we also, do things like prepare them for their oath ceremony. So we walk them through what the day of will look like um, and what the language of the oath will be so that they're prepared to repeat it because if they struggle to recite the oath, that can also fail them on their exam, even if they've already passed the test itself. 
Uh, this diagram here outlines our third educational program for adults. This is our HiSET program. So we, we've named this program the Educational Advancement for Refugees and Newcomers Program, or EARN. And this is really a middle step for people who lack formal education from their own countries and who might have low literacy or low English skills um, to be able to elevate their speaking, listening, and academic understanding uh, to be able to participate in high school level conversations. So most of the class content in this program is about eighth grade level for you and I. Um, we try to get people as far along that process as possible. And then once they actually are successful in our program, we forward them on to a partner like Workforce Essentials, the YWCA, or Martha O'Brien, where they can finish their um, high set practice and sit for the exam. So we offer three classes, reading and writing, social studies, and math. And in each of those classes, students are able to take an exam that will eventually allow them to exit our program and move forward in the process. Now, as you can imagine, all of those programs are currently online. Uh, so the way we've set this up is that our morning program is happening on Monday and Wednesday for citizenship at 10 a.m. Our ESL classes are happening at 9 and 10 a.m. And our high set classes are happening at 9 a.m. There's also evening programming for high set and citizenship. Right now, we don't have an evening program on the books for, or sorry, high set and ESL. We don't have an evening program on the books for citizenship right now. Uh, that's because we only have one citizenship teacher. We polled all of our students, and this is the time that works best for them. Those evening classes are happening on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6 p.m. currently. And on Wednesday, we've converted our community day into a conversation club. So we have partners come in, discuss key concepts like we did in person. They're not always able to do the same level of detail or style of presentations, so it feels a little different. But then we use the breakout room feature in Zoom and all of those students are able to have small group conversations where they're just practicing talking to each other about whatever topic was covered that evening. It's been a really successful class. We have lots of engagement and we definitely need volunteers to support that because we want to get those groups as, as low as possible. We want to get those numbers down so those students are getting lots of direct support. In the department, um, there are several people who work in the background. Uh, myself, uh, Sophia Marsani, who you would normally meet uh, when you come into the office for uh, an orientation, but since we're doing these online, just wanted to give you a sneak peek into the background here. Sophia is the person responsible for creating applications for every client and entering those into our different databases. And then she enters things like attendance data and assessment information. Um, to, then she is a, a native of uh, Nepal. To her right uh, is Fuzia Muhammad. Fuzia is our student coordinator. It's an adult ed specialist. That title recently changed. Um, but she's responsible for m actually assigning um, students their level when they enter the program and doing assessments. She'll, she'll, she'll pre-test them before they get into the classroom, fit them with the right teacher, put them in the right level class. And then after they're in the program for 40 hours or more, she'll administer a post-test to see what their progress looks like. Um, and then she helps um, us deliver that kind of information to our donors and reports. We also have one staff member that's not listed here just because I didn't have a picture of her to plug in, but her name is Allie Thomas. And I'm going to be introducing you all to Allie um, as a next step. So once you um, are placed in this department, Allie is the one who will sort of supervise your volunteer experience. Um, however, that is done through a number of filters that we'll talk about today. So um, Allie's the person to contact when your site coordinator um, is unreachable or you might have an additional ask. Um, if you have a curriculum question, if you have a question related to the book or technology. Um, but when you get placed in the classroom, the teacher in that classroom is going to be your primary contact. 
and your day-to-day -day support. So we'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute. Um, when we are in person, we have sites all around Nashville. We have one in Berry Hill. We have one in Southeast Nashville. We have sites inside of high schools. We have a site in Donaldson neighborhood as well. Um, so all together, we have five sites that we do adult education. Um, and basically the way that works is on the ground, they're site coordinators. So if you stick around long enough to be an in-person volunteer, uh, you will be working with one of these coordinators. So in the first top left picture, this is Nisha Chetri, who's a current level one student or teacher with us. So if you're placed in level one evening class, you might be working with Nisha. To her right is Shannon Ashford, who is currently teaching the level two class. Um, Nisha and Shannon also serve as child care coordinator and site coordinator at Glencliff High School. So all of our evening programs offer free childcare to our clients. Two of our morning programs do as well. The only program that we're not able to offer childcare for is our citizenship classes because they happen inside the library and there's no really good place to have a childcare program. To the right of that picture, you'll see Ingrid Cruz, who is the site coordinator at LEAD Southeast Prep, which is a middle and high school. Um, it is located right off of 24 and Harding, and we have about 100, maybe 60 to 100 clients that attend that site at any given time. Um, on the bottom left there, I love to use this picture. It's actually a little blurry here, but this picture was taken while Joey was being interviewed for a Lifetime Achievement Award for the work that he does in adult education. Um, but Joey King is a former Army Ranger and um, like I said, lifelong educator. He is the site coordinator at Woodmont Hills. Um, and that site is actually in the Berry Hill neighborhood. And um, we have probably, I would say, 60 students that attend that morning program in person traditionally. Now, um, to the right, you'll see Michelle Davenport, who's the site coordinator at Donaldson Fellowship. Uh, probably 50 to 70 students at any given time attend there in person. It is also a morning program. Um, these folks are all either teaching or supporting our ESL program online right now. So you may meet some of them in your experience with us. They may reach out to you for a various reason, like needing someone to substitute for uh, a class where a volunteer was not able to be there for the evening, for example. Are there any questions about the structure and the team at NICE before we dig into what you'll actually be teaching? Awesome, well, this is my favorite part. I'm a really big fan of our curriculum. Um, we use a program called Cambridge Ventures. So Cambridge University Press, the Ventures English series. And one of the reasons why this program is so exciting is just because of the content that's involved. So the curriculum is life and work related. So everything that adults need to survive here in the United States. Each unit starts from personal information and grows outward. So we begin with personal, school, work, community, and so on and so forth. Um, so we're gonna look at that in detail here in just a second. There are 10 units. We typically try to do two a semester. Um, so that's about um, two lessons a week or more, depending on the pace of your students. We've slowed that down just a little bit um, since being online because our classes are shorter, but we're asking the students to do more follow-up work so that they're getting the same attendance credit and basically the same time in class. It's just some of that time is asynchronous right now. Um, in each unit, there are six lessons and each lesson is dedicated to a different critical area of language. So one lesson is built around listening skills, speaking skills, reading skills, writing skills. And I'm gonna actually show you all um, how we're teaching that online here in a second and that'll become a little clearer. Um, now for all of our teachers, we provide detailed lesson plans. Those lesson plans follow the same format and make sure that each class has um, 
the, the instruction of new material, a time for guided practice, small groups, and uh, built-in assessment strategies, checks for understanding. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what those lesson plans look like, and I'll even show you an example today before you leave. Um, this entire curriculum is correlated to CASAS, which is a comprehensive assessment system for adults. Um, it is also the test that is used for the state of Tennessee, so it's correlated towards your progress on getting your high school diploma equivalency. In addition, uh, it is correlated to WIOA, which is the Workforce Innovations and Opportunities Act. That means that there are career and college readiness standards built into each of the lessons. Um, for example, um, there is a unit that talks about uh, time verbs and adverbs. And in doing so, the example that they use is a volunteer working in a nursing home. So they are highlighting the civic skill of volunteering. That gives you the opportunity to dig in what a, to what a volunteer is and why people volunteer their time. You also get the highlighted profile of what a nurse in a nursing home looks like or what a CNA looks like in a nursing home what activities they might be responsible for throughout the day while you're learning that grammar principle. So that's just one example of how it integrates that life and work vocabulary. Another thing that these books do that's pretty helpful is called spiraling, which means that topics from previous units will come back into um, the lesson, but with increased intensity. So you might be asked to do something to a more complex degree or to a greater depth uh, the longer that you've been learning the language. Uh, we find that's incredibly helpful for the population that we work with because it means they cover the same topic several times, but to different degrees. CASTIS is the assessment that I mentioned earlier. So before anyone is allowed to come into your class, they have to take a CASTIS test. We were able to actually pause that requirement when we first started with online learning. Um, and we've had a burden to kind of catch up and uh, administer testing for our new online students. So some people that you have in your classes may still be getting this test for the first time, but only if they're very new to the program. After they're in the program for around 40 hours to 70 hours, um, they're able to retake the test just to show their growth. We will reach out to the teacher in your classroom to see how they're doing in class whether or not they're keeping up with their peers, if individual students are able to complete homework assignments on their own, if they're scoring high on our unit tests, which are embedded in the Ventures curriculum. All that information will tell us when they're ready to come in and take a test. Uh, that information, whether or not they um, improve their test score, their unit tests, and their participation in class, teachers' recommendations, all get synthesized into their progress in the program. This program actually has six levels of instruction online. In person, there are seven because we can't really serve literacy level students digitally. So in person, our lowest level is our literacy class, which is for people who are typically functionally illiterate in their own language and are learning to graph letters for the first time. Um, this is a very high needs group and um, typically, uh, students will stay in that class much longer than others because they require so much remediation. Um, after literacy level, um, there is our introductory level. That's for students with a very basic understanding of English. So they might be doing things like looking at a picture of a box and finding the word box, right? Or correlating to begin um, uppercase and lowercase letters and understanding basic reading principles. So there is some phonemic um, awareness that's built into our um, curriculum. So for those of you who are aware, that's just the ability to encode and decode words. So breaking words apart as you're reading, working on pacing, understanding phrases, it's all there for these intro students. From there, they would go into level one, level two, level three, level four, and level five. By the time they reach level five, that is a conversation class that is built around people who are advanced to fluent, practicing their skills and applying them for a particular background area. So 
um, students who reach that level might also be enrolled in what's called our career orientation class, which just gives them exposure to a myriad of different job options and then has referrals to follow up if they're interested in a career area. So someone in our program, for example, who's interested in business might take our career orientation class and then follow up by taking a training certificate at Nashville State Community College. <clears throat> Are there any questions about the structure of the program and the curriculum so far? Before we move on, I'm going to actually show you what the book looks like. So this is the unit that most classes will be in right now. This is unit three. They've gone through personal information. They've gone through things that they will have to know for their school. And now we're to the unit on friends and family. And if you'll notice, um, the book blends um, pictures, words, and actually audio clips. So when you're using this, there is an available digital version called Presentation Plus, where you can just go in and click right on an audio file. Unit three, friends and family, page 33. Exercises 2A and 2B, track 21. Conversation A. Rigatoni Restaurant, Daniel speaking. Hi, Daniel. It's me. Rosa, hi. Is everything okay? Not really. I went to the supermarket with the children, and the car broke down. The car broke down? What's wrong? I don't know. Okay, so I'm not going to make you listen to the whole clip, but basically what happens is the audio file reinforces what's happening in the picture and vice versa. And then based on listening to the clip, they have to complete these activities and answer some questions. So this is an example of a lesson we might give. Obviously, there's a little pre-teaching that would go before this. Uh, but like I uh, indicated before, we provide lesson plans for all our teachers. Um, some of our teachers choose to create their lesson plans on their own. It's just available for anyone who is new to teaching so that you have a foothold. No one expects you to be an expert teacher. Um, we've basically tried to do as much support as possible so that anyone can step in and learn to teach this language. Um, this book is a huge resource. Each one of you, if you stick around to go to in-person, will get a physical copy of this book. And I believe that Allie's giving them out to volunteers right now to have with them during class already. So um, you might be able to come to the office and pick one up or have it mailed to you. Um, if you're looking at the physical book, these QR codes work with any smartphone. You just open it up, point and shoot, and it'll pull the audio file up for you while you're in class. Um, if you would prefer to go a little old school or don't have a smartphone, we also have um, CD players at every site. And those CD players have um, uh, discs that go with every um, book level for every unit. So you could pull the audio file up that way and have your students listen on a boombox. This program um, is really great. So that was a listening activity. This is a grammar lesson. As you can see, it has examples pre-filled for you for some of these things, but the teacher's edition will have it all filled out. In addition to this student book that they'll get, there's a workbook. So right now, all the students are receiving physical materials from NICE for this class. So they'll have a copy of the book in front of them at home and a workbook where they can be doing their homework. They're taking pictures of that homework and sending it in to us. So we get a lot of information from them. One of the reasons we chose to use this book right now in online instruction is we thought it would make a really good cornerstone for our distance learning program, and it's worked out very well. The students really like having a physical book they can work in, and the teachers like having something that they're used to teaching from. You guys are gonna see that in your classrooms. Um, any questions about ventures right now? Any time that this lesson gives you an idea to dig deeper or um, follow up with students, feel free to do that. You don't have to necessarily stick to the lesson plans. One of the things that you'll kind of learn is the class, every time you teach it, is a little different. 
and uh, we want to do our best to be responsive to the students that are in the room. So sometimes just by letting them answer questions, you can get a direction for your class to go in. Uh, I'll give you an example. So a lot of the content in these books is very culturally oriented. One of the units has a map where you're meant to identify the library, the post office, and a school. And they give you some context clues, but they're all culturally relevant, right? So the context clue for the library is a book drop-off. The context clue for the post office is a mailbox and a flag. The context clue for the school is a school bus. Well, if you're from Bangladesh, for example, they don't have school buses. Kids go to schools in rickshaws, where they're actually driven by, uh, by a bicycle. So they may not know what a school bus is. So there are some times where you will hit barriers with your students and you'll have to go, okay, how can I teach this so that they have the background knowledge? Um, you will learn a lot from your students in going through this uh, material with them as well, uh, like what it's like in the countries they're coming from uh, to deliver mail, because that system may look different in, uh, in other countries. Um, so there, there are a few obstacles that you might encounter but I'm gonna help you guys get ready to overcome those. Just out of curiosity, have any of you all taught a class before of any kind? Okay, I see a few hands up, that's great. So some of this material will probably be reviewed for you guys, which is great. Um, but if you haven't taught a class before, don't worry. Um, it's not as hard as you might think. There's a few simple things that you really wanna do that are honestly much easier to remember when you're online than when you're in person. Uh, like if you're writing on the board, you wanna pause what you're saying and turn and face the students and make sure they can see your mouth before you're um, explaining what you're writing. Because a lot of our students will use the lip movements that you're making to help them understand what you're saying. Uh, so it's really important to always face your audience, for example. Um, we don't have that problem on Zoom because most of what you're doing when you're typing or writing something out is screen shared and they can see your mouth already. Um, so that brings me kind of to our next uh, component, which is best ESL teaching practices. Um, I understand that um, these are not ubiquitous for all students. The thing to remember is that um, the brain works in a very specific way. Some of you probably already know this, um, but in your mind, uh, neurologists uh, call this schemas, but they're basically clouds of information that are connected to each other. So when you think of the word mailbox, you might think of the color blue or a letter or a stamp. You might think of a person who's delivered your mail in the past with which you had a friendship. Uh, you might even think, uh, when I say mailbox, of something completely off the wall that you didn't expect to. But all of those connections that your mind is, is generating, all those visualizations that come up, are that schema. Everything in that schema is culturally derived, right? So your picture of a mailbox comes from your personal and cultural history. Um, our job as educators is to try to activate a student's prior knowledge, help them understand uh, what you're trying to say by reminding them of what they already know. Um, one of the things about adults that makes it a little harder to teach new skills is that you can't really create new schemas of information. So we have to tie into what's there already and connect to what the student already knows. So if we're talking about mail and they haven't received mail in the way do, we do here, you might have to get creative to help your students uh, remember what mail looks like in their country or connect to a time when they've sent a letter, the language might be the challenge, the culture might be the challenge. So here's some suggestions to help you guys in, in overcoming that. One is if you hit a wall with your students and you're trying to say something and they're just not getting it, try paraphrasing the information. Um, so encourage students to paraphrase their own difficult vocabulary as well. If a student's having trouble um, saying they're explaining their thinking or finishing a sentence you might ask them um, to say it in broken English that's okay right this is something that we're learning together so when you ask a introductory student where they're from 
they might say, I from Afghanistan instead of I am. They might miss that linking verb, right? Uh, that's okay, right? We don't wanna, we always want to encourage students where they're at. Um, there is, um, there are ways where we can soft guide students to correct themselves without making them feel embarrassed. But I would say a lot of our students do have a challenge um, of feeling like they're successful, feeling like they're making progress. So we always wanna highlight wins as well. Um, use, the, use the book, use the text. So if a student gets stuck on a phrase, go back to the story, go back to what's in front of you to help them unpack it a little bit. Um, one of the things that I really like about this program is that usually when you ask a question, especially of low level students, the answer's somewhere right there in front of them in the book and they can find it. They just, we don't tell them exactly how to, right? We let them struggle through it a little bit and then there's an extra support we can add in by saying, oh, hey, you might wanna check the, the keywords list at the bottom to see if you can find the answer to this question um, and help them self-guide a little bit. Um, another example, and this is kind of what we talked about earlier, is tapping into what they know already. Um, one way you can do this is by having students work in pairs. That will already sort of naturally happen for your classroom. So one of the things that you'll see, especially in person, is that people from the same cultural group will tend to sit together because they know the same language and they might play off of each other, or help each other translate a little bit. Uh, that's okay to a certain degree, right? We want to encourage um, students to see each other as supports. We also want to make sure that those supports don't create a dynamic where one student is overcompensating for another student. Um, that happens a lot of the time with spouses. So I'll tell you guys a really quick story. Um, and really it doesn't go in one way or the other. We've seen it where the female spouse partner might compensate for the male spouse partner and vice versa. Um, it just depends on their own uh, education history a lot of the times and their own exposure. So who got here first, who's been here longer, um, how long were they in school might affect how well they're getting the language. Um, so we have an elderly Vietnamese couple um, in one of our level one classes and they've been there for a while. They've been in the program for a while. Um, and basically they always sit next to each other they always talk to each other during class and more often than not um, the male partner his name is tom will try to talk for his wife and <laughs> it's really funny because he he's now caught on to the fact that we don't like this behavior because <laughs> we'll be like okay tom let's let Va let's let van speak and see what she wants to say because uh, we need to know that she gets it as well and tom will kind of catch himself and chuckle now um, but a lot of this is very emotional for those couple pairs. You know, they're going through this challenge together. Um, if one partner is getting it and the other isn't, it can be very difficult. It can be challenging emotionally for them. And so um, softly suggesting that they each deserve a voice in the classroom and trying to get them both to talk independently is really important. Um, sometimes you might even want to mix your groups up where you have to separate them for a little while. Uh, they will hate it, <laughs> but it'll be good for them over time. Um, that particular group actually, um, Tom was ready to move on to level two for a long time and had made a lot of progress and Van was a little more stuck. And so they both stayed in level one for longer than they probably should have. Um, but when Van finally made a level gain and was ready to go into level two, uh, I sat down with both of the couple and just talked them through and I said, congratulations. We can tell that you've made so much improvement. We're so excited. And she's just in tears. She's like, I don't want to move up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we talked with them about it. I said, you know what? Why don't you just try level two, see what it's like. And if you don't like it, you can go back down to level one. And they've been in level two ever since then. And um, that was a few months ago. I think they're almost ready for level three. Uh, but they are just dedicated students that, represent, I think, what a lot of our students go through, which is an emotional challenge on top of the trauma we talked about um, previously um, to go through this process together. So there's a lot of um, reliance on partners, pairs um, that you'll see in your classes. We don't want to discourage that, but we definitely want to make sure that each client has a voice. Um, sometimes during a registration process, um, 
someone in the family will register a parent or a spouse or a sibling and they'll do a lot of talking for them and they don't want to come to class because they think they know it all already that's a little different of an emotional challenge and we do kind of have to separate those people out and say like hey this person's the one that needs class we actually need to hear from them um, so you know there are some interesting struggles like that and some power dynamics as i'm sure you can guess especially between male and female partners where culturally one is dominant over the other we don't want to try to disregard that cultural dynamic or um, be rude to the client but we definitely don't want to reinforce it in our classes either so if you're ever concerned about the way a power dynamic is coming up in your group definitely talk to your lead teacher about it talk to your site coordinator about it because we have experience navigating those conversations with clients that can be a little tricky from time to time um, basically, the biggest thing that's going to help you in your class is getting to know these students. Um, I'm, I'm always told by our new staff members, like, wow, how do you really know these clients this well? Uh, I've only been in this program for two years, but I can tell you, I hear stories from teachers like yourselves, from volunteers, and from other staff members, and we really try to take time to get to know all of our clients. Um, one of the reasons that we do that is because every client's narrative is so different that it impacts what they know. It changes their perception of language. It changes their perception of um, sometimes even the concepts that we're dealing with, right? So if we're teaching about a nursing home, that could be emotionally challenging for someone who doesn't have access to their elderly loved ones, right? Um, we did a family activity where we were trying to teach things like what is the word for sibling or uncle or cousin or wife, brother, sister. And one of our clients is just in tears because um, she could not spell the names of her kids. And it was very emotional for her. So there's all kinds of challenges. Getting to know the students in your classroom can help you understand what their background knowledge is. It can help you understand their history, um, their culture a little bit. Uh, most of our clients are very willing to share this information with you openly. And I would say that being in the adult education team, you're gonna get more access than other volunteers to those narratives because you're with the students so often in a very exposed setting where they're willing to take risks and be open with us about their life. Um, another really important thing is that we try to use visuals. Uh, you all saw that the visual in the book reinforced the audio. That's a really strong technique for English learners. So um, having a word written out, if you're going to have it as a vocabulary word, um, having pictures of a bus, if you're teaching what a school is, um, those kinds of things are very powerful for reinforcing because the word itself might not trigger something in a schema, but the picture could. And so by using several different strategies like visual supports, um, you're more likely to activate something that the student knows that they can connect to. Modeling is really huge. Um, I was just speaking with one of our teachers this morning that it's so important for students to know that we are not perfect, that we make mistakes and mess up too. Um, and it's, it's great when the students see that because it gives them a sense of safety and security and promotes what we call risk-taking behavior. So when you're doing an activity and showing a student how to do it, it, it really helps them understand how the language works, um, what the context is, modeling can be huge. And modeling in such a way where you're honest and make mistakes when you're doing an activity and are your authentic self at all times creates an environment of risk-taking behavior. So by fostering security and safety in your classroom, by being open, by being concerned with every student and their story, um, you can create an atmosphere where they're willing to speak up and try even if they get it wrong. Um, I would say watch the way you talk to your students and watch how you write because sometimes we might risk being too technical or um, using language that's too elevated for the group. So it's a little tricky when you're first getting started to figure out what language really goes with what level. 
but the books help you do that. So if you're unclear how to describe something, the teacher books have some supports in the margins that you can look through, and those supports are kind of written in the language that the students can, uh, can access. Most of the times, our students are placed in their levels and they're in the right spot. Every once in a while, even the book might be a little hard for a learner. Definitely, if someone's struggling in your class and they're not able to do the activities, let the lead teacher or site coordinator know because they'll be able to adjust the level of that student so that they're getting the best instruction possible, especially if it's a new student. Um, you may even find that in your group, there's some variation between um, like levels within a level almost. And what we try to do in our small group instruction is break people out into like low, middle, and high within a range. So they may all be level two students, for example, but some may be a little stronger than others. We try to group them together for their uh, small group practice so that we can differentiate what they're capable of dig a little deeper with those higher level students, slow things down a little bit with those lower level students. I would say one of the biggest um, things that come up with new volunteer teachers, um, well, really with any teacher in our program, is um, concerns about pacing. So sometimes it's hard to know how fast to go, how slow to go, how to know what's really um, understood by your students. Definitely take any opportunity that you can to ask questions, to dig into their understanding. Uh, what does this mean? How does this happen? Um, why is this here? So I'll give you an example. Um, one of the activities in the book has an identification card and it asks, what is the DOB for the client or for the person in the card, right? And so the activity is to teach them that DOB means date of birth, right? Um, and then to go through and say, okay, the month, the year, or the month, the date, the, can't talk, the month, the date, and the year is the order we say a date in the United States. Well, during that activity, you might ask a question like, what does DOB stand for? What does the number four mean in the date of birth? But then you can even dig deeper with some of your higher level students and say, why is date of birth on this card? Who would see this? What's the purpose of it being here, right? Um, how do you know your date of birth, <laughs> right? There's follow-up questions that might generate a lot of talk among your students that really gets them thinking. Anytime you can get your students talking about their thinking, they're gonna dig into the material deeper and come, out, come away with a stronger sense of understanding. So um, one of the ways that we facilitate that is with scaffolding. So students who need more support, we give them additional support at the beginning of the class and slowly take those supports away. So for example, if you were doing an activity, I just sat in a class this morning where the activity was personal pronouns. So we were just teaching them, I'm Brandon and I'm from the United States. What is your name? Where are you from? And then, you know, students would ask themselves these questions. A, an example of scaffolding might be to have the sentence stems on the board for the students. So in Zoom, you can actually go into the share and instead of sharing the presentation, you can share a whiteboard, for example. Um, if you're sharing the whiteboard, you can write on this document some scaffolds. My name is, I am from. And then if students are practicing, take part of it away. See if they're able to do it without the support. Take more of the support away. See if they're able to do it without any support. That is what scaffolding means. Adding in additional support at the beginning and slowly taking it away. It's a great strategy. Um, students really benefit from uh, written examples and so using the whiteboard is a huge way to hit home on zoom when you can't put things on the board in the classroom um, okay so this one's really tough um, bring authentic materials to class 
if you're teaching about something that you have a connection to already, which we all should because we were born here, we know the language, we grew up with it in most cases, right? Um, you might bring something into the classroom that's real related to that material. So for example, Joseph, I see you have a flag in the background. If we were teaching the US flag, you might bring a flag from another country in, bring something authentic with you to talk about, right? So then you would talk about what does the symbol on this flag mean? How does it relate to the symbol on the US flag? Um, that would be an example of bringing in material that the students can see and touch and, and experience that's authentic. Um, again, pacing is always an issue. So knowing how fast to go or how slow to go, um, if you're ever unsure, err on the side of going slow. <laughs> uh, don't feel like you have to rush through the material just to meet a deadline for us. It's more important that the students really dig into the material and can demonstrate that they understand it. So um, definitely, I think the, the thing that I've seen most often is that volunteers will churn through one or two lessons in a single class. They'll be like, okay, well, we finished this activity, finished this activity, let's just keep going. And they'll just churn through the book. Um, my challenge to you all would be think what you can do to extend what's in the book before you move on. So for example, let's go back into Ventures. Here's the student book, and this is on cell phones. So we have this graph about views on cell phones. Should I use my cell phone while walking down the street? Should I use my cell phone on public transportation? There's an activity here already, but we can connect to this with authentic material. Take your phone out. Have students do a skit. Okay, you pretend to be on the bus. You pretend to be the driver. You pretend to be someone on the bus. And then go to each student. Okay, I want you to be really obnoxious and on your phone, and we'll see how everybody else reacts. Go to the next student. Like, I want you to be really grumpy and be upset about literally everything that you hear. Uh, I want you to pretend to be a distracted driver and then just let it play out. Let them get creative with it. That could be an extension that we come up with to help teach this activity that digs into the material a little bit, gives them a cornerstone before having them go in and answer questions about reinterpreting this information on the graph, right? Um, so when you are unsure, always err on the side of slowing things down, unpacking them, playing with them a little bit. There's a great activity that we do in our program um, that you could do in Zoom <laughs> where uh, students are given fly swatters and on the screen, on the board in the classroom, there's all these different words. And basically when you call the word out, they have to try to swat it, right? So you could do it where on their screen, you post a bunch of words. Okay, everyone try to point to this one or that one, and just practice with them. You don't always get to see that they're doing it right, but it's still good practice, right? Um, so there's all kinds of ways to slow down the instruction. One of the things that you all will benefit from is that this is not the only time we're going to try to unpack this material with you. It, nobody expects for you to go from this session straight into the classroom with no other um, ac you know, access to um, materials or any other training and be a perfect teacher of this content, right? So every quarter, if you stick in the program, we do have what are called teacher in services where we'll bring everybody together and we'll practice this content. We'll unpack games for the unit. We'll go over ways you could teach this um, atypically. So it might be a game you can play in the classroom, a skit you could do. Um, it could be just any ideas that we have. We also in those spaces, and Eden is gonna be the one uh, helping to organize those for you. So this is not the last time you'll see her face. Um, but in those spaces, we'll also invite community partners to teach things like, what does it look like when a student is ready for community college? Or what does it look like when a student is ready to enter the workforce, right? Um, what kind of language would you need to be in retail? So we might have a representative from MAPCO come in and talk about, like, here's what we really expect out of our cashiers. 
you know, just to give you guys some context. Um, we've had a lot of great partners involved in those trainings and um, our site coordinators that I mentioned earlier will also go through the material and kind of pre-teach to you all what lessons to expect in the upcoming semester. Uh, now, one of the ways this is a little different now that we're online is that all of our classes have a lead instructor and multiple volunteers. So right now you'll be in the classroom learning from other people who are doing this already. Now, if you feel really confident and capable and an opportunity comes up, we're more than welcome to have volunteer led online classes. The challenge is that because we're giving our students um, capacity to participate outside of the classroom by submitting homework, watching YouTube videos, uh, doing special activities, contributing to message boards, all of that requires a lot of tracking and time. So we really believe right now that it's easier to find people we can pay to do the majority of that work and let you guys come in and do all the fun stuff, which is actually being in the lesson, being in small groups with the learners, facilitating Zoom a little bit, facilitating breakout rooms, and then supporting the teacher and contacting those students. Um, so one of the last things I'll say just about generally SL strategies is when you get used to teaching, in this environment. It's easy to fall into a routine. And in fact, you should. It's a great idea to start your lesson the same way, to follow the same general order, to use even the same language. Because your students get used to that language and can use it for transition. The difficult thing is you don't want to get into such a routine that you lose the interest or attention span of your students. So we always advise um, our volunteers to try to balance variety and routine. If the structure of your class is routinized, the activities every day should be really different so that you're catching the student's attention. Um, when I was a teacher, one of the things I loved to do was every classroom rearrange the furniture so that whenever they came in, it was something new and different and they could never feel truly settled, <laughs> uh, at least in that sense but I always followed the same outline for our day. So there was some structure and something to knock them off their feet a little bit, keep them guessing. Uh, that can be really important for your learner engagement, especially when we're all stuck at home, uh, sitting around on our computers, trying to learn a new language. Uh, that is a great way to kind of keep them engaged, bringing variety in. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is resources that we're going to provide you for doing this instruction. One is a syllabus. On the syllabus, it's going to suggest a pace. So it'll tell you how often you should move from lesson to lesson. It'll tell you when we hope that you're gonna administer a unit test, for example. So when should we be finished with unit four and going into unit five? Um, there will also be special events listed on the syllabus like our conversation clubs which all of our students are invited to. It's a community activity. Um, and um, when we're taking breaks for the semester, right? So um, in addition to that syllabus, you'll get a lesson plan template. Um, that lesson plan template is really how we talk about um, the lesson plans we give you all that you could use in the classroom. Um, I'm gonna show you an example here in just a second but they basically have the introduction of new material, the review of that material, some guided practice, small group practice, independent practice, okay? Um, they're only suggestions. They are also a scaffold for you all. So you can use them as much or as little as you want. When you're first getting started, it might be a great idea to lean heavily on the lesson plans that we've created so that you don't have to worry about creating uh, from scratch, a new um, kind of way of thinking about the, the material in the book. Um, that allows you to really dig into getting to know your learners too at the beginning of the program. The other thing we'll provide you with is an, a calendar. Uh, on that calendar, again, it will tell you uh, when our natural breaks are, when we plan to test students, uh, when we plan to bring in new students, and uh, when we stop for winter. Okay, so all of that information will be there for you as well as, so all this information is actually on our website, which I'm gonna share with you guys. 
Um, there is a specific website for adult education. We're gonna go through it here in just a second. But another thing that you'll find is just some basic information about a program. So when you do um, stick around long enough to go in person, there are pictures of each of our sites with uh, directions to getting into the building, information about where our classes are held at each site, and there's a little description about what we do in each one of these program areas, whether it's ESL, high setter citizenship classes. The other thing that's on the website is our lesson plan reports. So because we have multiple volunteers teaching multiple nights in the same class, we ask that at the end of every volunteer session, you write a little note about what lesson you covered and what you were able to accomplish that day. It might be something like as simple as we did lesson A in unit 10 and Juan was able to understand mailbox. <laughs> you know, whatever important information you want the next volunteer to know or the next teacher to know, you would put in that lesson plan report. Now right now, because we have lead teachers that are there every night of the classroom, um, the lesson plan reports are not being used. So you want to fill those out right away. But I'm gonna show you what they look like in case you stick around for another session. Because by January, we're gonna have some in-person services. We might even start have piloting. Well, let me put it like this. I have already started putting into motion piloting going back to in-person services on a very small scale that will start happening in November. So if any of you are interested in being part of those pilots, um, then you would need to fill the lesson plan reports out. So I wanna go ahead and show you how to use them. So let's go to the website. And if you have any questions for us while I'm pulling this up, now is a great time to ask them. I know I'm going kind of fast, but I'm trying to be mindful of your time and the fact that you guys are sharing your evening with us. Okay. So here is our, can everybody see this? Oh. Okay, great. Here's our adult education website. Uh, the wayfinding is a little tricky, but it's not impossible. <laughs> um, some of these topics are kind of nested into each other. Um, so when you get here to the home page, here's a picture of one of our conversation clubs in person over at Plaza Mariachi. Um, so here's some of our educators in the background with students around them. Um, you can meet the AE team. Uh, you can also learn about program information. These are our sites that I was mentioning to you before. Um, as we mentioned last time, we do ask that you report your hours and track it forward. So here in the website, is a link directly to that. So you can log right in to the page and submit your hours this way. Um, because you're volunteering in adult education, when you do go to log your hours, we ask that in the notes, you also put the time you actually worked. So I might put two hours for today in adult education. We're gonna put it in as English teaching, and then I'm gonna say six to 8 p.m. I have to put 6, 8 PM, 6 to 8 p.m. because the funders for this program in particular want us to timestamp our hours. So then I can hit submit. I'm not gonna do that because then it would actually give me time and throw our reports off, but that's what you would do next. In addition to that is our adult education calendar. And I won't scroll through all of this, but the calendar, um, everything from 2018 to now is in this page. So um, as you're going through, feel feel free to access that information. Um, there's also a placement guide. And Eden, um, this is the document that we are going to update, but basically this uh, online placement guide will have the teacher in every class, the volunteers in every class, okay, and their contact information. If you go to log into the website, this will not populate, it will be protected. So what will happen is that Eden and I, after this training, will give you all access to that document so that when you, when you open it, it'll actually let you in. Um, 
And Eden, what we also try to do every time we do one of these teacher trainings is remove people that are no longer volunteering with us. So if there's inactive volunteers, we might remove them from the shared list, but we'll just make sure that this is up to date for you all. And if you ever have a need to have someone cover for your class, or you wanna email the teacher that you're working with, their contact information can be found here, as well as mine and the other staff. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, if you do need to go, Joseph, that's not a problem. We probably have about 15 more minutes of this and then we'll have a chance for question and answers. Okay, yeah, we'll, I'm gonna try to be done by 7.30 at the latest. And then if anybody needs to stick around, I usually make myself available for the next 15 to 30 minutes just to cover individual cases, especially if it's a larger group, but we should all be able to get off before then. Thanks for asking. Over here, there's a tab that says AE, Adult Education Programs, and there's all kinds of content that you can access from here. So if you go to expand, let's say you're a pre high set volunteer, you would drop the tab down and expand it to go to resources for your program. Most of us are gonna be general ESL, so we're gonna go ahead into that category. This is where you're gonna find syllabus, lesson plans, and lesson plan templates. We kind of made that designation just for you guys. So this is reports. This is the pre-templated lesson plans that you can use in your class. So let's just go to syllabus. And I'll show you what one will look like. So it's got the day of the month, the lesson you should be teaching at that point, and the title. So Wednesdays for this program were community day. And they're doing the around town uh, unit. So it's got lesson A, do a goal setting activity. Lesson B, lesson C, learn about the airport. So on and so forth. And you can see some examples of our project partners listed here. In addition to syllabi, the let, which I hit this little box here and expanded it out. You could review it right here inside the website. This is what it looks like to submit a uh, report about your class. So let's say that I'm teaching lesson A. I would put my name in, the contact information, the date that I taught, and a few notes for the next person just to know what we were able to cover. If there was a struggling student or a concept that was difficult for the class, you might choose to include it here. Only people who are volunteering at this site will have access to the document and you'll see that it's leveled. So at the bottom, this is the intro, this is level one, level two. You can see some examples from previous volunteers Started with a get to know you icebreaker, went through lesson A, practice describing people. Um, the input from volunteers differs. So like this volunteer for this week just said intros and icebreakers, no book work, right? That's perfectly fine. Whatever you feel like the next volunteer needs to pick it up. Um, one of the things that will also happen is we will introduce you to whoever else is in your class, right? So uh, if you're in-person teaching back uh, in January and you're teaching on Tuesdays, someone else is teaching on Thursdays, we'll connect the two of you and get you communicating with each other um, so that you're sharing out information about the students and, and having a, a very solid pass off between classes. Uh, right now, that is gonna happen between you and the lead instructor and the other volunteers in the, in the classroom. Um, this is also a great opportunity to say like, hey, um, person who teaches on Tuesday, I'm going to be out next Thursday. Could you cover for me? That's kind of our first option for finding a substitute. So if you're in person or you're in Zoom and you can't make the link or the meeting, let your teacher know. Let your site coordinator know. And you can also reach out to your volunteer, your co-teacher, whoever's co-teaching that class on the other day of the week, and let them know. Um, 
we will be responsible if they can't take your class on or you, so mostly what we try to say is like let's say joseph and barbara are teaching on tuesday and thursday if barbara can't come in she might ask joseph to cover and switch days of the week if that doesn't work you would let your site coordinator know or your lead teacher know and they will find a sub for you you don't have any responsibility beyond letting them know okay it's perfectly okay to miss a few classes, but we do ask if there's an issue that's making you chronically absent and you know that that's going to be the case, let the site coordinator know because you might want to bring in another person to be in the class with you or bring in extra volunteers so you have some coverage. Does anybody have questions about this reporting document? Can you guys see it? I know it's kind of small. I can probably zoom in a little bit here. As you get into this document, if there is a problem and for whatever reason we're just not seeing a strong pass off between you and the other volunteer, that's when you might hear from Allie Thomas, just a slight nudge saying, hey, we noticed that um, you didn't fill out your report this week. We wanted to check in and make sure everything's okay. What can we help you with? How can we provide support for you? Um, the expectation is that after you teach, you upload a report indicating what you taught to your, your, your co-teacher within 24 hours. Um, that is because if you're teaching on Tuesday and you put that in on Wednesday, they only have Wednesday to prepare for Thursday's class. So it's really important that you update this the day after within 24 hours of teaching your class. And again, we're not doing this right now. You might be asked to do some increased student contact, but I just want to let you know that it exists and walk you through how to use it for when we go back, just in case you stick around. That way, all of our volunteers have the same amount of information. Let me also give you an example of the lessons we've created for you. So you would find your level, Let's do level two, because that's the book we were just in. I'll expand this out so it's easier to read. And we've given you lots of ideas for how you could choose to teach this lesson. So let's say that this is um, a welcome class. So this would be new students. You're not in the book. You're just getting to know them a little bit. So for this opportunity, you've got a warm-up activity, some review that you could do with them, an introduction activity, the presentation of new material, a check for understanding, and some practice. You would also assign homework. We do ask that homework gets assigned every class. When we're online, we are also doing homework from the book. Now they're going into unit one, personal information, lesson A. So what are we teaching for reading? What are we teaching for speaking and listening? It's written at the beginning. And then the same thing, what, what is your warm up for the day? What is your review? It's all there. You don't have to follow this, right? It's just there for you as a resource if you need some help. If you have time to plan your own lessons, we only ask that you try to include the same categories. So always start with a review of what you did last time. When you're introducing new material, make sure that you have a check for understanding to make sure your students understand the material. That you practice with them, guided practice. That you let them practice in small groups. And then that you assign some follow-up for them to do outside of the class. Any questions about these lesson plans? Yes, Barbara. Okay, Brandon, I don't have a, a question specifically about the lesson plans, but I am a little bit confused about the relationship between the teacher and the volunteers. And maybe yeah. that's a question for later because I, I just know, I mean, I've taught ESL before and I was just basically thrown into it, you know, and, and yeah. it out 
and here it seems like there's a really like a clear system and there and you have this really well developed um program but i but now i'm i'm getting confused about where like what it is exactly as yeah um barbara uh, thank you i mean when you're telling me the, the syllabus and things like that Thank you so much for asking that question. I think part of the reason that it's unclear is because I'm, I'm trying to inform you of how the program looks all the time and what it looks like right now. Um, so uh, when we are in person, our typical services that we've done for years and years and years, since 2005, the volunteer is the only teacher in the classroom. You are leading the instruction with a group of students. Um, you have at your disposal a site coordinator who's there to help adjust you to the environment of the classroom introduce you to the students be available if you have a challenge in the classroom but you would be the teacher in the classroom right now online because of the increased burden to do things like student tracking and homework review outside of the classroom it takes about 10 hours a week to run these classes from a teacher perspective so what we've done is hired teachers to teach every class. That means the class sizes are much bigger than what we usually do in person. So the class might have 50 people in it or more. Um, what that means is that some of those people are not participating by being in the classroom. They're watching YouTube videos of the class and they're doing the activities and, and uh, meeting with the teacher as often as they can to check in. Um, so to facilitate that, because we have so many people in the same room, what we're doing right now with our volunteers is having them support that lead teacher in small group opportunities during the Zoom meeting. So you start out, the teacher goes through a warm up with them, they introduce new material, and then they move everybody into breakout rooms. And that is where you guys shine. So you would be then with a small group doing follow up work, reinforcing the lesson, um, there's lots of creativity and input that can be done in these small group lessons. Um, but the other part of that is when you're not leading a lesson in the breakout room, um, we, we do encourage volunteers to do things like monitor the chat, help rename people, um, help mute and unmute students who are struggling. You might even have to call a student and help them get into the Zoom right because those are the kind of challenges that we have right now we do have an onboarding system where someone goes through and helps them install zoom and teaches them the wayfinding but they just don't always get it so part of that might fall to you all as volunteers in the classroom um so let me do does everybody kind of understand what's on the website there are some additional like teaching resources, but since Barbara brought up this great point, I do want to just um, move over a little bit to Zoom specifically. So um, remember how I said 75% of our users are iPhone users or, or cell phone users? That means that when they come into Zoom, they're just named iPhone <laughs> and they may or may not know how to rename themselves. So in that case, can you guys see my participant tab? No, okay, hold on one second. Let me see if I can, this is my own challenge here. What about now? Does that come up? Yes, okay. Eden shaking her head, yes. I just see Zoom. It says Zoom and join meeting and sign in, sorry. Okay, hold on. Let me work on this. It always happens when I don't want to share my zoom sensitive information that doesn't work and then when i do here we go how about now that's so weird i wonder why it's not working that's all right um what i'd like you guys to do is go into your own zoom right now and if you pull up your participants list by every person's name there's a blue box that populates um, that blue box gives you some options for those participants. Um, what we're going to do right now is um, basically play with those options a little bit. Eden, um, can you hear me? I saw that your camera went down. 
Okay. Uh, when Eden re when when Eden rejoins us, I'm going to have her turn everybody into a co-host and show you some of the things you can do to mitigate the challenges. Oh, we lost her. That's okay. That's okay because it made me the host. <laughs> um, so give me one second. I'm going to make everybody a co-host. And when that happens, you're going to get some additional functions here that I'd like to show you. Bear with me one second. Each one of you will be co-hosts in your Zoom session, and you'll be responsible for supporting the teachers with the technology as well. Now, if you are not a tech-savvy person, that relationship might change. So in talking to your individual teacher, they may ask um, that you actually share your screen or do some talking while they do some tech. Um, but for most of the time, um, when you're not delivering instruction in small groups, you'll be helping create breakout rooms, um, kick out students who don't belong in the session if they end up there somehow, or help facilitate uh, tech challenges that students are having. So now that you're all co-hosts, I want you to go to your participants page and it should give you an option next to every person's name. There should be a blue box that says more. If you see that more, can I just get a physical thumbs up if you're on screen, okay, great. In that more option, when you click it, you have an option to do a few um, extra things. Sorry, my own Zoom is being a little tricky. Um, so you should be able to, in your meeting, um, mute and unmute, ask students to take off video. Um, you can even put them into a weight room. So if you're familiar with the idea of the weight room, that's kind of where students get put when they are not, um, I think we lost. Sorry guys, I didn't mean to trail off like that. Um, when students enter a Zoom room, if you have a waiting room set up, it's where they have to wait to be let into class. But even if that isn't how you set the meeting up, you can pull a student into a waiting room and, and, and talk to them and say like, hey, who is this? Can I help you rename yourself? Can I help you identify yourself to the class? So those are the kinds of things you're gonna help with. Um, and I think, Sonia, that when we did this, we accidentally made you the host instead of a co-host. Would you mind making me the host again? So if you go to my name on your participants tab and hit more, you would just make me the host. Perfect. Thank you so much. And again, like just learning Zoom is going to be a big part of what we do. Um, you can actually, inside your view here, um, if you see when you're when you're in gallery mode, does everybody know um, at the top right corner you have a few views? You have a speaker view and you have a gallery view. When you're in speaker view, it's going to highlight the person who's talking. When you're in gallery view, you can see just about everyone. If there's more than a certain number of participants, I think it's 12, you'll have to scroll to see certain people. But in gallery view, there is also a blue mute feature that will pop up with every learner. If they're already muted, it will say ask them to unmute and prompt the student to come off of mute. So some of those kinds of Zoom features are what you can be helping the teachers with as well. Next to that mute icon, there's three little buttons. And you can turn their video off. So if someone is being obnoxious and walking around their house with a child in their hand, which we understand happens, but they may not understand that it's distracting, you could turn their video off for them, right? Or mute them. This happens a lot. I think I did it six or seven times uh, this morning. And we do teach about like muting and unmuting yourself when we onboard, but again, it just doesn't stick. So part of it is really just helping to reinforce that with the students a little bit. The other thing you'll see there is if you really have to, like there's a big tech problem and um, for whatever reason uh, you need someone to leave the room, you can remove them. 
with that feature. So you can hit those three buttons and actually kick them out of the class. Um, you can take away their permissions if you've somehow given them like host privileges. Uh, you can also um, rename them from the gallery view. So if somebody accidentally labels themselves iPhone user over again or they leave and come back, you don't have to necessarily pop up um, the participants tab. Um, there's all kinds of great things we can do in Zoom. One of the things that I really like to do is called um, remote control. So if I bring up a whiteboard, students can request to actually draw on my whiteboard and annotate it in real time. Um, so we can facilitate some of those things. Um, I won't go through all of this with you right now. Your teachers know a little bit. And if you're not already, you guys are gonna be like pro Zoom users before the end of this. <laughs> um, the other thing that I'll tell you is the breakout room feature. Has anybody not used breakout rooms before? Okay, so there's a few people, that's okay. So basically on the bottom of your screen, if nothing's being shared at the top of your screen, if it is, um, you're gonna see four cubes um, and the label breakout room as a host or co-host. And um, basically when you're the host or co-host of a meeting, it gives you the ability to create rooms that everybody can get kicked into and pulled out of. So you can go in and, um, I wish it was letting me share my Zoom content. I'm sorry, guys. Um, you can assign up to uh, any number of rooms. It will automatically split students into rooms for you. If you don't want students to be automatically divided, you can actually change the option to manually create the rooms and assign groups of students. Um, we always do manual and assign because we want to make sure there's a volunteer in every breakout room. Uh, so you're going to be able to create those breakout rooms, split participants up, and then have them come back into the room. There may be an entire day at the new session where we just practice leaving and coming back into the meeting because we're going to lose some students when we try this for the first time. Uh, knowing the difference for an intro level student of leaving the room and leaving the meeting is really nuanced, right? So if we do lose someone, we'll try to text, call, help that person back into the room. Uh, just as a quick exercise, because I know most of you guys know how to do this, but I just want to give you a sense of what it's like if you don't, I'm going to kick everybody into automatic breakout rooms for time's sake, and then I'm going to close those rooms and kick you back out, just so you see what it looks like for the students. So um, you're going to get a prompt to join the breakout room, and then when you're ready, inside that breakout room, there'll be in the bottom uh, right-hand corner of your screen a red icon that says leave. And then it's gonna ask you, do you wanna leave the room or do you wanna leave the meeting? So let's give it a shot. And I'm only gonna set these to close in about, um, let's say 60 seconds. All right, so everybody should have an option to join a room. Perfect. So a few things that uh, you guys might notice is there is a broadcast message feature. So you can message all the participants in any breakout room to say things like the breakout rooms are closing or um, ask a question for the group to discuss. Um, and then it also prompts you with a little warning that the breakout rooms are about to close. So that's just a really short crash course. Um, does anybody have questions about how to use Zoom are there things that you're not sure about that I can help uh, facilitate? One of the cool things about our program 
is that we also have access to a Zoom support specialist from their company because we are professional users and pay for a license. So we get all kinds of fun little tech features and shortcuts that some other organizations don't necessarily have access to. Awesome. Well, if you do have a question about Zoom and you want to stick around at the end, I have no problem doing some more troubleshooting or even making somebody the host and letting them play around with some of those more advanced features that only the host can see. Um, let's go ahead. We're almost through our presentation, but I want to tell you what's going to happen next. Um, so like I said, lesson plan reportings, 24 hours. Um, we do ask that as a volunteer, these are the same as what we went over in our orientation, that you commit to a minimum of nine weeks and that you commit for at least one class a week. Now that one class right now is only an hour, right? So the extra hour would be for your planning purposes and communicating with the teacher. So it's up to a two hour a week commitment. Um, we also ask that if you go back into in-person classes that you're submitting lesson plans electronically. Um, there are unit tests that we administer with the teachers. So all you're doing right now is helping support the administration of those tests. The lead teacher might ask you to help them if it's a very large class with grading tests if you're available. But that's only if you're interested, it's not a requirement. Um, we also ask that if you're with us for up to a year, that you attend three out of four available adult education trainings so that we're able to touch base with each of our volunteers and teach you guys some new things as they come along. Again, we understand that you can't be in every class and that absences happen. We do ask you to keep them to a minimum. If you know you're going to have an absence, let your teacher know or your site coordinator know. And if it's something that's developed as a chronic absence, please, please, please don't feel guilty in letting us know that. We will bring in additional support so that you can continue working with us, but so that there's an extra layer um, uh, to help students with being consistent. Um, I'm gonna skip this just a little bit here. I'm not gonna go over everything. Um, we, we follow the Metro Nashville public school system in scheduling our classes. We also call, uh, follow federal holidays. Um, when you get your teacher's book, this is really important, and Eden, you're going to be the one helping us um, facilitate this and collect this. When you get a physical teacher's book, we ask you for a $35 refundable deposit. So if you have checks, which I hope most of you do, but it's okay if you don't, um, writing a check to NICE for $35 is the best way to do this, because when you turn your book back in, we'll void the check you won't get charged. If you want us to, we can hold on to $35 cash or whatever you want to do, um, but we do ask for that deposit. If there's an issue with that, let us know because we can probably waive that. It's just a layer of protection for us because we do have to pay for those books and if they go missing, it can get quite expensive for the program. Um, we do have, again, on-site copies of books, teacher's editions, and CDs, but while we're online, everybody will have access to what's called Presentation Plus. Allie will give you the links there, but that's the digital version of the textbook with those built-in audio files. So you won't need to go looking for any of that stuff. Um, attendance is taken from Zoom, so you don't have to worry about that right now. When we go into class, it's a little trickier. Students actually have to sign their name in a box and then put their time in and time out of the classroom. When we get to that point, we'll have the site coordinators walk you guys through that because students do commonly make some errors there, but it's a great life skill. That is because our funders require that level of detail in our attendance tracking. Um, and again, students do kind of struggle with that a little bit. Um, we always ask that students register before they come to take class. Sometimes what will happen is uh, Maria will bring her friend Jasmine and ask if Jasmine can sit in your classroom. That's fine, but what you need to do is let that student know that to be in the class, they have to be enrolled. So after they sit in for the class their first time, you would inform your site coordinator, we'll give them an application and they can't come back until they go through the right channels. Basically, that's because we have quite a long wait list for our services. There's a huge demand for NICE in our community and we have anywhere from 125 to 400 people waiting to get into our classrooms um, at any given time. 
Um, that's all we're going go to go through right now, because I think the rest of it we can handle in real time. So um, this is dated. I apologize. I'm going to skip it. Um, the next steps, if you haven't done so already, Eden's going to coordinate with you to get your background check submitted. You'll get a chance to observe a classroom. So it says shadow a classroom. Right now, all of our classes are actually recorded and posted to private YouTube channels so that students can watch them after the fact and that they're not accessible to the public. We're going to allow you guys to go in and watch some classes. So Eden's going to send an email after this with a few links. I think a few is a better idea than one. Um, maybe intro level two and level five and get you a, give you a chance to watch a few different levels. You don't have to watch the whole class, but it'll give you a better sense of what those classes look like right now. Um, we will also give you your assignment. Instead of school and level, it'll be what teacher you're with and what level student you're teaching. If you have any preferences in a level, let Eden know and we'll try to get you matched as closely as possible to your preference. Um, we will collect that book deposit when you come in to get your book or if you want to have a book mailed to you or dropped off at your house we're doing those things as well so we would collect that deposit at that point then we will give you the link to your first class and the day you'll start so you'll get all of that information from ali thomas so basically to, to tell you as an anecdote what eden will do is send you an email saying like thanks for coming i've got your background check everything's good to go let me know how you want to get your book i'm going to introduce you to ali thomas she's going to give you um, the information about your teacher and your link and then ali will basically schedule with you guys um, your first day of classes does that sound clear as mud just about <laughs> Great. Uh, we do have a master document of all the class links. So if you do want to go in and observe a live class, you can coordinate that with Allie before your first day and you can see students in real time. That is perfectly okay. Normally what we do during these orientations is we actually do them on site during classes, break up and go observe um, some classes and come back and talk about them. So it kind of stinks that we can't do that together, but it's so great to be able to take the time you need to go through those classes and look at it at a detail level. So if you do have any questions after your observation, um, feel free to reach out to me. Again, uh, my email address is Brandon, B-R-A-N-D-O-N, at empowernashville.org. Um, I will pop that into the chat just so you have it. Um, and basically all of our staff members are our first name and then Adam Power Nashville, by the way. Um, nobody right now is an exception to that rule. Sometimes we get like a Aaron L or something like that, but, um, so you have my email in the chat. You'll get email, um, Allie's email as well as Eden's. And hopefully, uh, this has been a helpful uh, deep dive into what our English classes look like and the resources we provide you guys. Oh, one other thing. When Eden does um, send out uh, the introduction to Allie, Allie will give you, like I said before, she'll give you your access to Presentation Plus, but she will also send you the adult education website. If you don't get the website and you want access for whatever reason, if that doesn't happen, don't feel bad just reminding us, hey, we still need this and we'll definitely get you all the resources you need before your first day of class.